Welcome to the Financial Freedom Podcast, where we interview remarkable people and share strategies for mastering money and living a meaningful life. With your host, Grant Sabatier, creator of Millennial Money and author of Financial Freedom, a proven path to all the money you will ever need. Hey, everyone. I'm really excited today. This episode means a lot to me. We're going to chat about financial freedom, a proven path to all the money you will ever need, which is available worldwide now. I put my heart and soul into this book, and I've invited Cody Berman from Fly to Fi, who's going to be joining me on the 40-plus city date book tour, invited him on the podcast to actually flip roles and to interview me about the book. He's read it. He's completely familiar about it. Hey, Cody, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Grant. This is going to be a ton of fun, and like you said, I've read the book three times, and it is just an awesome blueprint when someone says, what is financial freedom? You hand them this book and they're set. Hey man, I really appreciate that. So let's flip the mic, give it to you. Where do you want to start? What do you want to chat about? Yeah. So I kind of want to just talk about your money philosophy and I guess what inspired you to write this book and where your mind was at and where you hope that people will get to after reading financial freedom. So I was in a very different place when I started my financial independence journey at 24 than I was at the age of 31 when I sat down to start writing this book. And looking back, I realized that I'd done more right than I had done wrong, but obviously I'd learned a ton through the entire journey. And in fact, pretty much my life philosophy changed during the process. At 24, I was so stressed out. I had no money. I was living back home with my parents. I really just wanted to escape. You know, I wanted to get out. I wanted to have freedom. I wanted to be able to do whatever I wanted with my life. I wanted more money. I wanted more life. And so really for five years and three months, the five years and three months that it took me to get there, I was, that's all I was focused on. You know, I ended up making a lot of sacrifices that in hindsight, I probably wouldn't have made. But now looking back, it's cool because I can relive the journey and more importantly, help others along the way to not make the same mistakes that I did and actually to do it more efficiently than I did. Because when I started, I didn't know any other financial independence bloggers. There were very few blogs out there. I didn't discover another FI blogger till two and a half years into my journey. So I was flying alone and learning as I went, which actually was awesome and fun. But once I found some others, it really fast-tracked my process. Looking back and really the core focus of the book is, you know, we live in a world that sells a level of financial precision and tries to sell a level of financial precision that to me is an entire is entirely unrealistic. You know, you have the finance industry saying, you know, you need $5 million to retire. Or you need all this amount of money without knowing who you specifically are. And to me, the most important question actually isn't how much money do I need? That's an important question. But the first question you should be asking is what kind of life do I want to live? And that should drive how much money you need. And I think that in our culture, it often is the other way around. It's okay, here's how much money I make. And then you try to live a certain life and you often uh, end up overextending yourself. And so really starting with that kind of here's how I want to live and figuring out how much money you need as opposed to the other way around. And for me, it took me a while to learn that. I feel grateful for the time and space that I've had to, to think through that. But when I started, man, it was all about getting out. It was all about escaping. And so I want to fast forward to when you're 24 and you do have this $2.26 in the bank account. And in your first chapter of your book, you talk about how money is freedom. And I'm sure that didn't, it wasn't exactly apparent when you first started this money journey. You just wanted to hit this million dollars and that would quote unquote set you free. But at what point during that journey did you really start to believe that money did truly equal freedom? Money wasn't just this arbitrary thing that you needed to gain in order to be happy. I come on, I just want to know the mindset shift and when that happened. Yeah, to be honest, I didn't feel that until I'd already become financially independent. I, you know, there were certain moments, of course, where I was clearly less stressed about money. You know, once I had one year of expenses saved, which for me was $100,000, I remember feeling different. I remember feeling like, oh, okay, it doesn't, you know, 
if if everything you know if everything falls apart i've got this money i can survive you know i felt like i did have quite a bit of breathing room but one of the things that i didn't realize until i became financially independent was that i had 95% of the benefits at that point when i had you know one year of expenses you know i had more time i had more freedom i didn't use that time for anything other than trying to make more money but you know that's a key part of the book is that you don't need millions of dollars or even to be financially independent to have more time and space and freedom and more control over your life and less stress around money and that's something i didn't realize personally until i'd become financially independent so even though i was much freer through this journey I, I was I was so laser focused on financial independence, which you know I think is kind of a warning for people because to me, you know, pursuing FI ended up becoming kind of money addiction in another form. And there's nothing wrong with like wanting to make a million dollars and become financially independent. Obviously, I'm a huge believer in it, but I put off a lot of those things in my life, ironically, that you know I could have enjoyed along the entire way. I didn't stop and smell the roses. And so something that you do talk about in your book, because there are some numbers to it, even though it is more about the journey, it is more about understanding that money is a tool that buys you freedom. I know you kind of just set this arbitrary $1 million goal when you were in that your deepest depression state, I guess, when you were 24, you want to hit this million dollars, but there didn't sound like there was too much calculation behind that. So for someone who's trying to figure out what exactly their number might be, I know there are some general rules of thumb, but could you just talk to how you can calculate and determine that number? Yeah. And going back to your first question, uh, or your first point, yeah, I didn't have any calculations. I just said a million dollars because, you know, being a millionaire obviously is attractive from a mainstream perspective. I mean, that's, that's a lot of money. Obviously when I was starting, it was a ton of money, but I didn't actually figure out how to calculate and get closer to that number until probably a year and a half into my own journey. And that's when I started discovering, you know, the Trinity study, the 4% withdrawal rate, all of these sort of traditional, I'd say, retirement models um, as I had started investigating because a huge part of my own journey was to look at money completely fresh. You know, I took, I, I looked at money as a human invention. I, you know, really put all of my sort of past emotions and the power that money had over my life. I kind of put those aside and looked at it fresh. And so I was reading everything from, you know, popular, you know, personal finance books to even retirement studies. You know, I was, I was looking into academic research. I was in my sort of study of money, I was going broad and deep. And I stumbled on the Trinity study about a year and a half in and then started reading completely independent of reading any blogs all about safe withdrawal rates and how much money would you actually need. And so about a year and a half in, I realized that I was actually pretty close to my number and that a million dollars wasn't that far off. I needed about 1.25 million, which is 25 times my annual expenses of $50,000. And interestingly, you know, I was I was pretty close all along. And one of the things I looked at was all the retirement calculators out there told me I need I needed between 3 and 4 million dollars, all the popular ones at the time. And I just thought that that seemed like way too much money. And I figured, you know, what's the least amount of money that I would need? That's how I went into it in order to retire. Um, another thing I figured out was about a year and a half in was just the impact that having a recurring income stream, whether it's from rentals or businesses, how that would actually reduce the amount of money I would need. And so, you know, there's kind of two ways in my head to reach financial independence. You either save up a bunch of money, like, you know, $1.25 million, or you have recurring income streams, like, you know, a few rental properties that are putting off enough money to cover your living expenses, or it's some hybrid of the two. And that's when I also got really excited because I was like, I might not even need a million dollars. I just need, you know, three rental properties. I ended up going the route of saving a million dollars instead of buying the rental properties. But, you know, a hybrid approach works too. And in fact, now in hindsight, I probably could have become FI even faster and actually believe that real estate is tried and true 
the fastest path to financial independence. Um, but the cool thing is you might not need millions of dollars. You might just need two rentals or you might need $500,000 in one rental. You know, it can be a hybrid uh, of, of the two. So something I want to jump into in kind of a three segment stage is just wealth accumulation. And it's as simple as you earn money, you save as much as you can, and then you invest the rest. So I want to tackle the earning front first and whether it's side hustling, whether it's hacking your nine to five job, just what are some ways that just the average person can think about increasing that income number? So in the book, I talk about this idea of the enterprise mindset. And that's really the mindset that I had. You know, I put, I gave it that name, but it's the simple idea of, you know, how can you manage your life kind of like the richest people in the world do? And one of the things the richest people in the world do, you know, I care less about, you know, they take cold showers or they meditate 10 minutes a day. <laughs> and what I cared about was like, how do they actually see the world? And when you look across them and I did this, you know, I didn't read any studies on this. I just, you know, I thought about this myself. And one of the things I saw was that they, they, they look at money and they use money kind of as a tool. You know, it's not like a finite thing and it's something they're always trying to maximize the efficiency of. And so the enterprise mindset is simply looking at the world through the lens of how can I make the most money with my time? And there's many facets to that that obviously I break out in the book around, you know, how you're optimizing your full-time job, um, how you're starting your side hustle, how you're managing your taxes, how you're investing, how you're just using money in your day-to-day -day life and doing it in kind of the way that best sets you up for your money to make money and also take calculated risks. So the enterprise mindset is really throughout the book. And I think a lot of people, they don't look at their life that way. They look at money making in silos. And they also, so many people they, 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 they think about kind of, yes, they want to raise or yes, they want a bonus, but they think about money and the opportunity to make it in too limited of a term. You know, there's literally money making opportunities everywhere. If you learn how to see them literally everywhere, and it's getting easier every day to make money both online and offline, but oftentimes people don't know where to start. And that's why in the book, I, you know, focus very specifically on, optimizing how you're making money currently first. And that's often with your full-time job. And whether you like your job, or you don't like your job and you wanna leave and you wanna quit, currently that probably represents the place where you're going to have the biggest opportunity to make more money. Or if not, you're, you need to learn that it's not and then leave and get another job where that is the opportunity. Life's way too short to be stuck in a job that you don't like. One of the things a lot of employees don't know, and I know this simply because, you know, I've been both an employee and a company owner, is that it often costs between 40 and 60% of your annual salary for your company to replace you. That's a ton of money. And you could probably get a five to $10,000 raise just tomorrow walking in and just making the right case for it. Just because your company, you know, if you're a decent employee, if you're a crappy employee, that's a whole nother thing. But a vast majority of people, they're good employees, they're earnest, you know, they're working hard for their money, but they don't realize that they actually have the upper hand. There's far too many employees who are afraid that if they go in and ask for what they want and what they deserve and what they should be getting paid, they think they're gonna get fired. And so that, po that power dynamic, man, is always at play in the workplace and a great way to kind of get over that is to just make sure you have enough money saved to, you know, if they did fire you, which the chances are extremely low, that you'd be fine. You know, you can actually stack the leverage in your favor in terms of having six months to a year of money saved, in terms of having relationships with recruiters. You know, I break that out very, very specifically in the book about how to build and establish and leverage relationships with recruiters in your industry. You know, so you're creating this huge, soft safety net where if you make the case, you know, for making more money and you get fired, you've got a recruiter who has, you know, two jobs lined up for you in the wings. So it doesn't matter. And so stack the leverage in your favor and focus on optimizing your full-time job by making sure that you're getting paid what you're worth. It's never been easier in history to figure out how much that is. There's so much data out there on what people with your skills and experience should be getting paid. And then, like I mentioned, the recruiters, such an under-leveraged resource. 
contact two or three recruiters, four recruiters in your industry. They're, they want to talk to you. Those are the people that live closest to the market. You know, they're the ones who get paid to place people like you in jobs. And so they're going to know what you should be getting paid. They might have an opportunity for you that you never thought about. They'll probably give you information on those other skills that you can learn to uh, increase your value to your company and your career. I talked to one recruiter one time uh, about a person and she actually recommended just a slight shift in someone's career path that would end up making them over a million more dollars in their lifetime. You know, they were a junior graphic designer and instead of becoming a senior graphic designer or a creative director, shifting and becoming an art director. Just that subtle shift from creative director to art director and building the skills uh, that are required in, in different industries would have resulted in over a million dollars more pay. And that's something that, you know, someone just starting out or maybe, you know, you don't know, but a recruiter can, can clue you into that and help you design even the best career path for you. And so starting with your current employer, your current full-time job, making sure you're getting paid the market rate or above, figuring out how much you're making your company. You know, there's a systematic process in the book that I've outlined for that, how to figure out how much money you're making your company and how much you're worth to them. And I've been able to do this because, you know, I've owned companies myself. And this is what I did, man. I had a spreadsheet where I calculated the ROI for my employees and the net margin on them. And I very specifically knew how much money I was making on each employee. And so when someone was making me six times what you know they're getting paid, there's a lot of leverage there. And gosh, I can't tell you such a small percentage of the employees that I ever had ever asked for a raise, let alone made the case that I outline in the book. And, you know, you got to start there, man. It's like, you got to try to make as much money as you can in your full-time job. This is the other thing. So many people think that their bosses are really kind of paying attention to what they're doing and that their bosses see everything that they're doing. But, you know, a vast majority of times, you know, they're stressed out because of their boss and they got a lot going on in their life. And you're only good as the story that you tell about the value that you're adding. The better storyteller that you become in life, the more money you're going to make in both your full-time job and with your side hustles and throughout your life. You have to learn to make the case for yourself. And obviously I outline that in great detail in the book, how to tell that story, whether it's in your full-time job or side hustle. So, you know, these are some of the things that, you know, I feel grateful having the experience of having been both an employee and an owner because I outlined the, the stuff your boss has never told you, the stuff you might not know if you haven't owned a company, the, the exact way that, uh, you know, if my employees had laid out the case and asked for a raise, they would have gotten it. But, you know, most employees, they're they're, you know, they're too afraid. They're too worried. They're going to get fired. And, you know, if, if you don't take advantage of that opportunity, your company, your boss and your company, they're in the business of making as much money on you as possible. That's capitalism. You know, most companies are just legal pyramid schemes and the money, money rises to the top. And so you have to figure that, that system out and use it to your advantage as opposed to, you know, just being, you know, exploited by your boss and exploited, I know is like a negative term, but I mean, that's the way businesses work. That's the way they make money. And so you need to learn how that works and use it in your favor. Yeah. So I really like your, the narrative you've written about the whole enterprise mindset. And this is a perfect transition into something that, something that I'm super passionate about, which is side hustling. And you do mention and talk about that a lot in the book. And I like something that you, you dispel. And it's this thought that you're worth like a certain dollar per hour figure. And I know that even when you were making multiple six-figure income, you would watch your neighbor's cat for 60 bucks, I think it was, <laughs> on the weekend. And like you said, you don't want to leave that money laying down on the table. And that seems like a relatively low-stress job. You probably feed the cat and maybe, I don't even know, pet, pet it a few times. <laughs> yeah, actually, the, it ended up being a little bit of a stressful job. And I think I've only revealed this once, but... I ended up outsourcing the cat watching at some point because what ended up happening, I'm actually allergic to cats. And so <laughs> I had to take Claritin before going and watching the cat. And then I found another neighbor who ended up watching the cat for me simply because, you know, I didn't want the, the allergy issue. But yeah, the, the point still stands. Make money any way that you can to invest. That was the mindset. You know, making money just to spend it you know, go out on the weekend, you know, that's not how you get there. It was like, I need to make not only as much money as possible, 
but I need to invest early, often, and as much as I can. So that $60 added up. I mean, it totally added up. For sure. I just really like the mindset there because even though you might have been making $100 an hour in your main gig, you're taking 60 bucks for the weekend to watch a cat. And <laughs> I didn't know the the allergies and all of that, but it's just the fact that there's money to be made everywhere. And we're definitely not telling you to go dig a hole in the ground for a dollar an hour just because someone will pay you for it. But if there's money making opportunities that are relatively low stress and like you highlighted before, they're everywhere, then might as well take them up. You're never too good to make money in some certain facet. So I just, I wanted to highlight that. But the next thing I want to ask you about was the saving front. So the next piece in the equation, and there's a lot of different ways to do this. I know you have a certain way you like to budget and it might be different than other people, but I'd love if you could just highlight and touch on some different ways to save money. So one of the things I want to start out with is to me, I realized pretty quickly that there's a limit to how much you can cut back, but there's not a limit to how much money you can make. And I think a vast majority of personal finance and money advice just focuses on that cutting back aspect. And one of the things I realized, like, you know, those small purchases, the $3 or $4 coffee or the glass of wine or hanging out with your friends or going to concerts or your Netflix subscription or your magazine, any subscription you have, it's often those things that give you the most amount of joy in your life. And we live in a world where we're, we're told to save money. We need to cut back those things. And I realized pretty quickly, I was like, I don't want to cut these things. Like I really, you know, I really enjoy them. The entire time that I was working towards financial independence, I was drinking stuff. Stumptown coffee, which is like ridiculously expensive, but ridiculously good. And it just gave me, it made me happy. I mean, every morning I get up, I make it, I enjoy it. You know, I know that I'm paying an arm and a leg for it, but it makes me happy. But the world tells you to cut those things, to focus on every single cent that's going in and out. And yes, in the grand scheme of things, those small purchases do help a little bit. You know, being mindful of them, but just making sure that you're spending your money to maximize your enjoyment. And often those small things give you the most enjoyment. So don't cut those small things because you're going to feel miserable. You're going to feel deprived. You're going to jump off the wagon. And then budgets, man, I've never had a budget. They always just freaked me out and just stressed me out. And one of the things that I realized pretty early on when I just looked at my own spending was that I very clearly saw that I spent and consequently most Americans spent most of their money on housing, transportation, and food. And in the book, I took, call it the only budget you'll ever need. And it's the only budget that I've needed. And maybe you're really like, you know, if you're the type of person who wants to track every penny and track the cost per unit of the granola that you're eating every morning. And, you know, I, I meet some people and they literally spend less than $100 a month on food. That's great. If that's you, I love it. More power to you. That's just not me. And so for me, just knowing that I could reduce my housing expense. I moved from a $1,500 a month apartment to an $800 a month apartment. Yes, it was a little crappier. Still had two bedrooms. It was kind of on a noisy street. I probably didn't sleep as well. My wife, then girlfriend, <laughs> she wouldn't come over. She complained about it. She didn't like it. But like most things in life, nothing's forever. And I, I was making what most people would view as kind of a sacrifice, I viewed as an opportunity. And for me, moving to that smaller apartment, the net effect of that will be hundreds of thousands of dollars over my lifetime just doing that for a couple of years. So keeping your housing expense as low as possible, that's how you get your savings rate from 5% to 30%. That is that that's how you make it happen. Even now today, living in New York City, this is one of those those challenges often that I have with, with my wife. We're living in an affordable, nice, great apartment because even now still I understand that keeping your housing expense low, transportation expense, don't buy a new car. Try not to even have a car. If you don't need one, don't have one. There's so many ways to get around. That are, that are more uh, more affordable today. And then the food thing, there's so many ways just to, to keep your food costs down or just realize the trade-off that you're making. And that's an important thing, even that I've learned now living in New York City, there are entire economies here in New York City built around the fact that most people are so busy. And so you just go into the grocery store and you, know, you can buy a pepper, like one organic pepper, you know, for a couple bucks, maybe two or three dollars, but that pepper cut up is like six or seven dollars, 
you know, I mean, it's, but for some people, they're so busy that paying someone else for that labor is worth it. And just realize that any convenience, even like I'll order takeout on a Wednesday night, that's like 30, $35 when I'm really busy because my time is actually better spent doing other things and just realize just the trade-off that you're making. In some cases, it's worth it. In some cases, it's not. And then also food's one of those things that tends to be healthier if you make it yourself. If you really like cooking, it can be really enjoyable. And this all goes back to the central point. The book doesn't tell you how to live your life. You know, I'm not saying don't buy this, don't buy that. I'm just simply showing you the trade-off that you're making. If you're going to buy a new $40,000 truck, realize that it might have taken you 2,000 hours of your life, your time you're never going to get back, and that you're going to have to work five or six more years in the future to afford it. So not only did you trade a year of your life, but you're going to have to work five or six more years at the end. And those trade-offs, that's your call. The more money you spend, the more money you're going to need to save, the longer it's probably going to take you to become financially independent. And this is one of those things, man, I hear over and over, you know, people talking about, I don't make enough money or my job doesn't pay me enough or I can't cut back. Money is one of the things and, and, you know, how you live your everyday life. It's one of the one things that you can control that can give you more freedom. You don't have to spend $200,000 a year. Even if you have multiple kids, you don't have to spend $100,000 a year. You have that power. That's why it's the only budget you'll ever need because housing, transportation, and food, you control those three things and you get your savings rate up to 30, 40, 50%. Spend the rest of the money however you want. I mean, seriously, even myself, it's like, you know, every month I would have, you know, $2,000 put into one of my checking accounts and I just knew that everything that was in there, I could just blow every month. And oftentimes there was some money left over, but because I knew there was money in there, I wasn't stressed out about what I was buying. I didn't even have to pay that close of attention to it because that money, you know, I'd already saved and everything else. It was like the day-to-day purchases, those small things. I didn't think twice about them. Even going out to like $150 dinner, I'd go out and have that dinner and really, really enjoy it. And I didn't have to worry about it because I was already, you know, my savings rate was already 82%. Yeah, I really like that because you can't dictate how someone else lives their life. But Grant, while we were, you were talking, I was running a few numbers on these super cool calculators that you have on the Financial Freedom Book site slash tools. And so someone with $50,000 in their retirement account, they go out to a $100 dinner, they're sacrificing 17.6 days of freedom, which is just absolutely mind blowing. So when you kind of frame it like that, like, is this dinner worth 17 days of freedom? Maybe it is to you, maybe it is. But It might not be. And when you shift into that, and I'm sure you can talk a lot more about this, when you convert money into time units, it really kind of just blows your mind. Yeah. The first time I did that calculation, it was $100 for six days of freedom. So by the time I actually figured out how to do that calculation, I already had quite a bit of money saved. And consequently, the more money you have invested, the more you have saved, the less $100, less freedom that it actually buys you. Man, I'm so stoked for people to use the calculators. Um, They're all completely for free, even if you haven't bought the book, but they're designed for you to use as you follow along with the book. And I really wanted to build something that made it come to life and that you could carry around in your pocket every day. They all work on mobile. And so you can literally be in the grocery store and you could put in your numbers and put in your purchase and be like, whoa, to buy this... $20 $20 thing, I'm, I'm going to have to work two more days in the future. Obviously, for bigger purchases, it's even more profound. If you're like, I want to buy this $500 coat and you're like, whoa, I'm going to have to work 47 days in the future. <laughs> I'm not telling you not to buy it. I mean, maybe you really want that coat. Just, just like everything in life, it's about being more mindful and just realizing what you're trading for it. Okay. So let's bring this thing full circle. And so the last piece of that basic equation is investing. And Something that you talk about in your book, you call it the seven step fast track investment strategy. And a lot of people think that investment investing is so daunting. You need to be this real like this financial guru, this financial advisor who knows about all these different stocks and how to price them, but it's a lot more simple than that. So I'd love if you could just weave the how to invest with this strategy. Yeah, you can invest in anything. And that's, you know, we're we're constantly inundated every day with invest in this, invest in that. I got an email yesterday from some company that wanted me to invest in a fractional share of a luxury car. And the thing is, those companies have a lot of money to market. 
And so people invest in these things when they don't have a lot of money. And that's not what you want to be investing in, you know, when you don't have a lot of money. That's something like really, really rich people use to diversify their investments. And yes, art and automobiles and wine are good investments if you have millions and millions of dollars already and you want to diversify your portfolio. But that's not where you start. You should not be investing in any of those things when you're just getting started. One of the things I realized is that most people kind of lump investing all into one, when in reality, you should be thinking about having a different strategy for short-term investments, which is money you're going to need in five years or less, and long-term investments, which is money you're going to need in 10 plus years. And so we live in a world where everything's lumped together and we're told and believe that we need to make money quickly. You know, and that's the irony of this is that a vast majority of those kind of short-term investments tend to be really really risky. The first time I ever bought a stock, I put $3,000 on a stock um, that I didn't know anything about. I remember investing in it and just like over the next 48 hours continuing to refresh my phone and just getting so stressed out. I remember getting like my palms were sweaty because I was watching the stock that I knew nothing about go up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And I ended up selling the stock 48 hours later and lost, I think about $700, maybe a little more. It was so emotional. And I was obviously thinking about investing the entire uh, entirely wrong way. So if you have less than $100,000 saved, for example, you shouldn't be thinking about investing in individual stocks. Or if you want to invest in individual stocks, only take 5% of your money. So 5 thousand of that hundred thousand dollars and invested in individual stocks. Individual stocks, a vast majority of them are too risky, especially for your long-term savings and your short-term savings. So the money that you're going to need in five years or less, whether it's for a down payment on a house or education expenses, or you're saving up for a trip, you know, that's all money that you need to, and you want to take less risk with. And so whenever you take less risk, you're going to get less reward. And so investing that in, you know, an online savings account or, CD, at least keep up with inflation, which tends to be about 2 to 3% per year. Thankfully, right now, when this is airing, there are an incredible number of great online high interest savings accounts in the market. Savings account rates have increased significantly over the past year. So you can get 2 to 3% in a lot of places. Ally is a great place. You know, there's a few others. Uh, where you can get those great rates where you're going to park your money for the short term. Definitely don't keep it in a normal savings account. This just boggles my mind. I think it's something like Americans miss out on $50 billion of interest because they keep their money in low interest savings accounts like their bank savings account. And that's something that's just like, just don't do it. Like with two clicks, you know, you can at least keep up with inflation and not lose money. And then for long-term investments, you know, I'm still a huge believer in total stock market index funds, which represent instant diver diversification. And from an asset allocation standpoint, I walk you through how most people actually think about asset allocation wrong. Asset allocation is that percentage of asset that you have traditionally it's going to be the percentage of your money that you have in stocks and bonds and cash. I think a lot of the advice out there, especially for younger investors, is way too conservative. You're told to keep your age in bonds, but that's really, really old school advice that I think is really destructive. And so I outline an entire, and it's just one chapter. It is the longest chapter in the book. It was the hardest chapter to write because there's literally books and books and books and books. Yeah, you know, I could have written an entire book on investing and I put it all into two chapters, but it's a step-by-step -step strategy that specifically designed to help you pay as little tax as possible and make the most efficient use of the different types of investment accounts that you have available. So, you know, investing in your 401k and IRA in a certain way, and you know, there's way, it's way too granular to, to dive into in one podcast, but that's why it's a step-by-step -step strategy because it's literally like do this, then do this, then do that. 
And man, I got to tell you, Cody, that most CFPs that I've talked to don't know the best sequence to invest in in accounts, especially how to invest to retire early. And that's like a whole different strategy. And I talk about the differences relative to, to retiring early and investing and whether you should put certain amounts of money in your taxable accounts. And obviously all of this is a starting point. And I wanted to present the most comprehensive starting point for you so you could use it to customize it based on your own specific financial position. And that, that's really the important thing. But pretty much everything that you need to know about how to set up, invest tax efficiently, and in, an, in a way that requires very little of your time to manage is, is in the book. So it's all well and great that we're talking about financial independence and how to calculate it and all these nitty gritty numbers, but it isn't just about the numbers. You have to actually adopt this mindset, adopt this philosophy, and realize that money is a tool. Everyone can do the math if you put the equations in front of them, but actually making these changes in your life and just rewiring your brain to think about money is definitely something that's difficult. So I'm curious, Grant, what kind of habits or at just at least just tricks have you set up for your own, for your own self to make these changes in your life? So the first thing is it's a lot easier the the closer your relationship is with money. And this is one of the things, you know, we spend more time every year planning for vacations than we do managing our money. And so one of the things for me is I very early on started spending between five and 10 minutes a day with my money. I call it my money meditation now. I actually did this even this morning where I'll wake up and when I'm having my coffee, I'll open Mint or Personal Capital, usually both of them, and I track kind of where I'm at. In the book, I outline very specifically what I do every every day, week, month, quarter, year. But I always start with now what I call my money meditation, which from a mindset standpoint, if you're starting off the morning thinking about your money, you get more comfortable with it. And when you get more comfortable with your money, you're less emotional about it and you're more intentional throughout the day. And so, you know, when I go to buy something, for example, I'll have already spent some time with my money and I often spend less because I want the numbers to keep going up, not to go down. And that brings up another point where momentum is so important. And so one of the things when you're first starting out, it can be really uncomfortable to figure out how much you need and figure out where you're at. But when when you start tracking your net worth, for example, which is just your, you know, your assets minus your liabilities, you see your balance go up. You invest you know, one week, you see your imbalance go up maybe $10. And that's really actually exciting. And then you start investing a little more because you're making some money on the side and you see your balance go up by $100. And then you start seeing your investments grow. And it's really the momentum that makes the habit formation really, really easy. Because I could say like, do this each day and do this each week and do this each month. But that doesn't matter if you don't feel like you're moving forward. So the key thing is to get the momentum as quickly as possible, even if it's only saving $5 more per day. And I can tell you one thing, man, once you start tracking your net worth, it starts to get addicting. You know, and then instead of like being afraid of your money, you actually wake up and you're excited to see how far you've come. And that, man, it's just a that that carries you through. I mean, that ends up being all that you need. Your habits form themselves because you're so excited about investing more money. And I used to do something, you know, I'm, I'm a little OCD when it comes to money. I mean, obviously I wrote an entire book or, about, about it, but whenever I look uh, and open my, my balance in the morning, if I saw that the numbers were like an odd number, I'd try to round up to an even number by investing more. And so if I had more money to invest, I remember having like 7000 $913. And that would always bug me. And so I'd invest $87 just so I could get it up to 8,000. You know what I mean? Or, you know, like I'd always like invest that next amount to try to get it to even numbers. And that's just a small thing that is kind of fun and helps you save more money. I mean, for me, I think that like managing money and, and that momentum is even easier than like dieting. You know, people often compare the two things and it's like, you, you see the results almost immediately if you just start doing this a little while. And then most people, the anxiety they have around money is simply because they're not spending enough time with it. And you don't have to, it's not like I need to spend three hours every month, just five minutes a day, you're going to get comfortable with it. And then all of a sudden you start to realize that it's something you know better and you feel more comfortable and you feel less emotional and it feels like a familiar friend. 
that you enjoy waking up and hanging out with. And then, you know, you start to realize the potential that it has to transform your life. And that's why I built out the seven levels of financial freedom in the book, because when you get to kind of each level and you start saving more money, you're going to feel less stressed. It's going to be easier to sleep at night. You're going to feel more freedom in your life. You're going to feel more ang- less anxiety around money. And that's the cool thing, man, because you can, you can either let money control you or you can control it. And the easiest way to do that is to just get familiar with it and control the relationship instead of letting it control you. So I know it's very difficult to think in retrospect because you can't relive years that didn't happen. But if you could go back and hand 24-year-old Grant the Financial Freedom book, how do you think you would have lived your life differently? I can tell you that I would have been less stressed along the way. I've read over 400 personal finance and investing and entrepreneurship books. The reason I wrote Financial Freedom or one of them is that I had to dig really, really deep and go so many places and live it to have the experience in the book. So you're literally getting, you know, you're getting like 20,000 hours of my life more. You're getting like 25,000 hours of my life packed into one book. I had to go too many places to find it. And so if I would have had it at 24, I would have felt less stress because I would have had an end-to-end system in my hands. I would have had a roadmap that would have been much easier to follow. It would have been easier for me to side hustle, that's for sure. Learning how to side hustle on my own, like when I started, you know, side hustling wasn't really a thing. You know, it was known as kind of like freelancing. So I felt like I had to learn all that from scratch. I think the thing that took me the most time to learn more than the mechanics was how to sell, you know, and I write a lot about selling and storytelling in the book. So I probably would have sold projects easier. I also really struggled once I turned my side hustle into a full-time business. I didn't realize the trade-off that I was actually making. And what I mean by that is, and I talk a lot about this in the book, is making that transition from a side hustle to when you start having employees and hiring people. For me, managing people ended up being something I didn't enjoy. And it was something that created a lot of stress in my life, simply because I really liked doing the work and I liked learning and I liked growing. But when you build a company, You start spending more and more of your time being a manager, dealing with HR issues, you know, doing those things that really just aren't very much fun. And so in hindsight, I probably wouldn't have launched and started and grown my companies in the same way. What I would have done is been more of a solopreneur and just accelerated it. And what I mean by that is I felt like I needed to build two companies and have employees. And it was so stressful, man, like being on the road 30 weeks a year, going to clients, managing people. It was so much more stress that I would have taken on. The fastest path for me would have been getting a new rental every year, a couple of rentals, building a portfolio of four or five properties while having more of a solopreneur, smaller business, maybe a couple employees and doing it with a specific goal. Now I know of building those recurring income streams. And so maybe instead of selling, you know, big projects to my clients, getting them on monthly retainers. And if I had set my business up to be a monthly retainer business, as opposed to just a project, just that one simple shift, I might still be doing what I was doing. And I'd be making $50,000 a month and not having to do much from just my rentals and my you know, subscription or recurring revenue business, as opposed to having 20 plus employees that you got to pay their medical expenses and their benefits and all those good things. So I probably would have been able to maybe not do it faster, but had less stress, spent less time on it. Yeah. <laughs> and it would have been a lot cleaner. You know what I mean? And I'd probably, I'd be making more money today. I know that's not, that's not always the goal. You know, I ended up walking away from a lot of money because I'd built businesses that unfortunately were, were too dependent on me and, you know, just had way too many moving pieces. Like I really admire those people who are able to build hundred person companies and not be stressed and still sleep at night. That definitely wasn't me. But hindsight bias is twenty twenty, so you can't kick yourself for, I'm sure, all the important lessons you learned along the way. Oh, man, I feel really grateful. It feels like a lot of that time was really a blur. It really was a blur. It was like a constant roller coaster of working and burning out and working and burning out, which is easier to do when you're, you know, 25 years old. Not as easy to do, you know, now that I'm, I'm 34. So I feel grateful that I used 
my intense intensity in my 20s to do what I did. I feel grateful I made it through. I feel more grateful that I did make it through and that now I can teach others. You know, that's the cool thing, man. Even like chatting with you, like you're so far ahead from a mindset standpoint, you know, than I was at 22. You've had more tools and knowledge and there's more out there. Man, I was like treading this path alone. I was like, can you imagine like you're trying to do this and like you don't know anyone else that's doing it. And now there's communities of people and there's, you know, the path is clearer. And that's, I mean, I can't wait to see what people do with the book. You know, I mean, I can't wait to get that call from that 22 year old who's like, oh, yeah, man, you know, I graduated college in two years and I'm financially independent. I'm 22. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, gosh, but you got to give back, man. Like, that's the cool thing is like, it it really excites me, even though I didn't have the book, you know, I'm excited to see what people do with it. You got to give back, man. Life's too short. Like, seriously, you know, I could have kept growing my companies and making more and more and more money. You don't realize how you're going to grow and how you're going to change. And if you let yourself like truly give yourself the time and space to sit in not knowing where you're going to be and the time and space with which to exist, you don't know what's going to happen to you. And that's the thing, man, like I don't even recognize who I am now in a good way. Like when I was 25, I was stressed out. I was like so intense, so hardcore. You know, I missed, I missed some of those things that I would have paid attention to. And man, the huge shift for me was just those first reader emails that I got, like you helped me save $10,000, man. I just got one uh, this morning. You helped me save $13,000 in 2018. And man, those emails, they fill me with a level of joy that is so much greater than money. Now I'm, you know, focused on that, but you know, I could have just kept making more and more money, more and more money, but I'm, man, I'm just really excited to see, you know, just the, the blog has been such a blessing to my life and so much fun. I can't wait to see what people do with this book because it works. Yeah. I mean, you know, it works. <laughs> That's the really exciting thing. Cause at a time of increasing uncertainty and not knowing money truly is freedom. And that doesn't mean having millions of dollars or tons of money. It means just having enough money to live the life that you want to live. Everyone deserves that man. Everyone. So on the same thread as of giving back and just, you don't need the money from this book. I mean, you're already financially independent by any standard. And I know this book was more of just a passion project for you. So where do you envision this going in one, five, 10 years? Because I mean, if you hand this to someone and they actually absorb like every chapter, this could literally transform someone's life. You'll, you'll have people who could potentially retire at age 30 all across the nation or all across the world. And it's just a, such a transformative thing to understand this financial, this financial freedom at such a young age. So where do you see this going in the next couple of years? Oh man. <laughs> Loaded um, question, I know. There's kind of like where does it go for people and then where does it go for me? I think for people, it truly is a path to freedom. I lived it. More and more people are living it every day. I'm excited to see more people defining what success means for them. I think that's kind of where it starts is don't just accept the traditional success narrative. It's never been easier to live life on your own terms. I think the gig economy you know, the increasingly sort of digital nomad economy, there's a paradox inherent in it. Yes, it's never been easier in history to make more money. But on the flip side, as it gets easier to make money, certain things and industries get more competitive. There's also a lot of challenges in being a solopreneur that not a lot of people talk about. Yes, while it's satisfying, you got to spend more time chasing down payments. It's, you know, you got to, there can be mental health challenges with it. It's not all sun and roses. And some people have advantages that other people don't have. But I do see generally the the playing field being leveled it it is easier no matter where you come from to build monetizable skills i really do believe that skills are future currency so in an age of increased automation the more skills and the more diverse the skills that you have and i talk about this in the book the more money you're going to make and that's the cool thing cuz i see people launching their own brands and learning how to build websites and brand and code and design and sell and analytics and those are all skills that you know are the skills of the future and it's cool to see people building those. I hope that the people that do become financially independent and financially free from the book, you know, that they go on to help others. They go on to experience life to the fullest. One of the things to me, the purpose of life is to be truly alive and everything that that means. And 
very hard to be truly alive when you're working 50 hours a week and get 10 vacation days a year. I'm not saying you can't do it. And if you love your job and you love your life and, you know, you might've already won the game. And that's some, one of the things that more and more people I meet, you know, they've got partners they love and friends they love and kids they love. And they're so stressed out and they don't realize that they've already won the game. You know, they might not have as much money as they want, but you know, they're living amazing lives. And so you know, take a moment to look at what you already do have. But for those that become financially independent, you know, I hope they go on and, and help others do the same and then create art and build communities and spend more time doing those things that, you know, really help others as opposed to just, just helping themselves. You know, I'm sure there's people are going to read the book and I'm waiting for that call, man. Like I got it already on my calendar. That first call I get from someone's like, you know, I made a hundred million dollars, you know, and I'm going to tell them, okay, now it's time to, to, to give, give that back. It's cool, man. It's all, uh, just, it's just my, uh, my little ripple into the universe and I hope it helps, you know, as many people as it can. For me personally, I've now written over half a million words about money. And one of the reasons I wrote the book is because I wanted to put down everything that I thought someone should know about this. And literally two hours before this went into production at Penguin, I was still making changes and I was still putting things in. And there's a couple things that I wish I could have included that I haven't. And, you know, I'll write those as bonus chapters and blog posts. But, you know, for me personally, I feel like I've said everything I need to say about money. And this was kind of a reflection back on what I learned and what I would have done differently to help others become financially free. And for me, I think I'm going to move on and write about a lot more than money. And I already have started writing about more than money. So I, uh, you know, I want to make sure to, you know, help, help others on this journey while also continuing to grow myself so I can write that next book that will help, help others, uh, as, as they continue their journey. All right, Grant. So the book is finally out today and I was fortunate to get to read it in advance, but this is the first time that it's being released to the public, the masses. What do you hope that people are going to get in this initial read through of the book? I hope they take away a few things. First, that no matter where you're starting from, no matter how stressed you are in your job, in your life, how little money you have, where you're at, what type of job you have, how old you are, financial freedom is possible. And while financial freedom probably means something different to you than it does to me, than it does to your friends, no matter what it means to you, you can get there. And it's never been easier in history to make it happen. And the strategies in the book work. You know, more and more people are using these strategies to create more time and space in their life and more time for the things that they love and to build lives that they love. And you really can, you know, have all the money that you'll ever need. And also that you don't need millions of dollars or even to be financially independent to get a vast majority of the benefits. You know, if you're just trying to save a million dollars or retire early, if that's your only goal, it's going to be harder to get there. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you have student loan debt or you're in credit card debt or, you know, you're just starting out, setting that goal of a million dollars is great. But the first goal is to get to the next level of financial freedom. And for most people, that's getting clarity on where they're at right now and laying it all out in the open and seeing where you're starting from, because you can only start from where you are today. And when I started this journey, not only did I have $2.26 in my name, you know, I was almost $20,000 in credit card debt. And so I was starting from nothing and literally beyond nothing. I was starting from negative. And the thing is, no matter where you're starting from, you have to start from where you're at today and focus on just getting to that next level. If you're, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, I can tell you one thing. Once you have six months of expenses saved, and that might take you a while to get there, you're going to sleep better at night. You're going to feel calmer. You're going to feel more freedom. You're going to be less worried about your boss you know, if, if, if he lays you off or if your company goes under or if something happens, you're going to feel better. Just get there. That needs to be your goal, not saving a million dollars or becoming financially independent. And then once you have one year of expenses saved, I really encourage you to stop and, you know, look around and see what you already have. And no matter where you're at, the first place to start is looking at, 
your life and asking yourself, is, is this the life that I want to live? And even though that's a tough question, you know, look at your friendships and your family and where you're living and what you're doing. And that might be tough to take a cold look at, but I can tell you, and I'm hopeful that if you're listening to this and if you're, if you read the book, you have so much more control over building a life that you love. Literally, it, it's in your hands and, and money is a path to freedom. It might not be fast, but this book is helped is, is designed to help you get there faster. And you really can live a super awesome life and you have power and control over that. And once you get to a year of expenses or two years of expenses, I really encourage you to take the time to reflect first on how far you've come and then on where you want to go next, because just because you're on a particular career path or living a particular type of life doesn't mean that you have to keep doing that. You've, you already have so much freedom. Maybe it's taking three months off and traveling. Don't defer your dreams to the future. The biggest regrets that people have on their deathbed is that A, they worked too hard and B, they didn't live lives that were true to themselves. And so many people get to the end of their lives not having fulfilled their dreams because they spent their time living the life that they thought they should live or that the people around them thought they should live or their parents thought that they should live instead of living the life that they wanted. And so you have this opportunity that, that so many people don't have. And this stuff really works and put it into practice, keep at it, support each other, talk to your friends about money. You know, we're all on the same journey around the sun. And it means so much to me that you've taken the time to listen to this. For those of you that, that buy and read the book, thank you for taking the time to read it. I wrote it for you. I didn't write it for me. And I really hope that it helps you make more money and have more time in your life for the things that you love. And it's just a true honor to, to, to write this book. And I can't wait to hear and see what you do with it. And Grant, working with you over these past several months, I mean, this is your passion project. You just text me or email me with the craziest ideas. And I know that, I mean, this is your passion. You love helping people. You love this concept. And when you're that passionate about a book that you wrote and that you're sending ideas for the Facebook group, you're sending ideas to make the website better, just all these little things, I truly think that this is going to transform thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of lives. So thanks for including me on this grant. And this this, this journey has been amazing. Yeah. I mean, uh, to be honest, my sort of purpose in life, my mission, it found me. I didn't find it. And that's one of the things is life is really infinitely rich when you open to it. We live in a world that tells you to find your purpose, to find your why, to do what makes you happy. And, you know, we'll end on this. If you don't know what that is, that's okay. A lot of people don't know. When I started this journey at 24, I had no idea what my purpose in life was. I had no idea what my why was. I didn't even know really what made me happy. And so don't worry if you don't know that yet. You probably just need the time and space to figure it out. And this is the perfect way to do that. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Check out the book available today worldwide, wherever books are sold. To learn more, visit financialfreedombook.com. And I can't wait to hear what you think. Thanks for listening to the Financial Freedom Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review and subscribe. To learn more, get show notes, and dive deeper, visit financialfreedombook.com.